Tonight, Facebook's power play, shutting down news information in Australia. Is this a turning point in the history of the internet? You've got tons of questions on this. Welcome to Q&A. Welcome to the program. Joining me tonight, the Communications Minister, Paul Fletcher, the Shadow Minister, Michelle Rowland, former News Director, Hal Crawford, the eSafety Commissioner, Julie Inman-Grant, and international security expert, Lydia Khalil. Please make all of them feel welcome. <laughs> well, as things go, a lot has happened today. So, how do we reach this point? For most of my lifetime, consuming news was black and white. But now, like a majority of us, I get my news online. And my modern viewing habits mean that I'm exposed to advertising in a different way. And so, as the global online giants gobble up advertising dollars, some of the local long-standing publications are shrinking and disappearing. In response, the federal government devised world-first legislation to make big tech companies pay for news content Pleasure to safeguard you. public interest journalism. Friend and colleague, Paul Google's response was to threaten to remove its search engine from Australia, and it also refused to rule out pulling other services like Gmail, YouTube and Google Maps. Facebook also retaliated, announcing it could remove news from Australian feeds. After talks with the government, Google introduced a compromise, News Showcase, offering to pay media outlets for some behind the paywall content and display it more prominently. Now, while Google has reached a deal with Australia's major media players, Facebook has dug in its heels. Not only is it refusing to pay for news here, in a dramatic escalation overnight, it blocked Australians from accessing news on their Facebook feeds and prevented people overseas from sharing Australian content on Facebook too. It's a high stakes battle for these multi-billion dollar companies and while Australia is a small market, a lucrative pay deal secured here could set a precedent for other bigger markets around the globe. So will this be a turning point for big tech and the responsibility it takes for what happens on its platforms. Now, you've probably noticed that neither Google or Facebook are here tonight. We've invited representatives from both companies to join this discussion and they've declined all our invitations over the last year or so. Uh, now, this is Will Easton, the Australian boss of Facebook. Of course, the Zuck is there as well. Uh, and this is Mel Silver from Google, as well as uh, the head of Alphabet and Google, Sundar Pichai. Now, we are extending that invitation to them again tonight. They do have our contact details and the technology apparently to do it. Uh, and we welcome them to join this conversation at any time because you've got loads of questions from the, for them. And later in the show tonight, uh, the Rubens will be here. That bit is guaranteed. They've got a superb new track. Our first question tonight, though, comes from Harry Cham, who's in our studio audience, one of the many people that have written into us since waking up this morning and finding that Facebook newsfeed is effectively dead in Australia. What's your question for the panel? I think the government misunderstands what users go onto Facebook to do. They go there to get COVID public health updates. They go there for updates on bushfires. The list goes on. By introducing this code and Facebook responding by stopping Australian news, the government is doing the public a disservice by denying people access to news. What can the government do to fix this problem? Because it's important the public gets access to news if they choose to get it on Facebook. Paul Fletcher. Uh, well, it certainly is important that people have access to news from a diverse range of sources. Uh, what Facebook has done, uh, we think, is the wrong thing to do. And some of the consequences we've seen uh, today are things like uh, fire and emergency services, uh, health, uh, the Facebook pages of various government departments being blocked. 1-800-RESPECT, the service for sexual assault survivors, for example. And, and North Shore mums. Uh, serving 25,000 people in my electorate of Bradfield and surrounding areas. So this is very concerning uh, and we're very clear that, first of all, 
uh, they should not be blocking, uh, well, we don't want them to be blocking any pages, but certainly none of these pages would fall within the definition of news within the news media code. So yeah. even on the terms of their objections, it makes no sense to be blocking You can't pages. be surprised, though, that this has happened. This is exactly what Facebook said in an open letter in August of last year. They said it again in the Senate hearings in January of this year, that if you push through with this, they'd have no choice but to switch off news on their site. Was it responsible for you to push this point, this kind of brinkmanship, during a pandemic when you're trying to roll out public health information? Facebook and Google have made certain threats. I want to acknowledge that Google has now changed its approach and has constructively uh, engaged. And indeed, we've seen reports of deals between Google uh, and Seven West Media, uh, News Corp and uh, Nine Entertainment Limited. Um, but the point is very clear. Uh, we certainly don't want Facebook and Google to leave this market. But if you're doing business in Australia, you need to comply with the laws of Australia. We've gone through a thorough public policy process over three years. We're ready to engage, and we have engaged all the way along, but you must comply with the laws. But, but they of the said they would Parliament. have to do this, and you pushed the point. Whose fault is it then? Them or, your, them or yours? Uh, well, we expect people to comply with the law if you're doing business in Australia. And um, if you're asking me who has to take responsibility for turning off access to pages providing vital public health information or uh, providing public safety information, uh, emergency services, the, the, the party that has to take responsibility is the party that did it, and that party is Facebook. Does that stack up for you? So, so the, the, the issue I have is the news was free before. Where the, the news, we didn't, you know, they didn't charge for news, and then now the government wants to ask them, you know, to pay for it. It, it doesn't make sense. What was free doesn't become uh, monetized overnight just because of a legislation. You're not the only person that's written into yeah. us about this today. Theresa Corbyn is from the con uh, communications consumer group ACAN. Uh, you're talking about a lot of the people you work with. In fact, your own site has been taken down. Can you just describe what the impact has been? for a lot of people with Facebook pages that are not news. Today. So thousands of charities, not-for-profits, small businesses, Indigenous communities, groups that push out uh, warnings about fires and floods have all been affected today. And this doesn't just affect the news sites, it affects all of us. So people can't get the information and Facebook has become a gatekeeper and they have too much control. The Minister says it's Facebook's fault, do you agree? I think Facebook could have given us a lot more warning than they have. They certainly haven't given us any guarantees about bringing the information back, and we really need it. Otherwise, what's going to happen now is that I think this could end up being like Cambridge Analytica being a storm in a teacup. This is going to be worse because so many groups only use Facebook as their website presence. They don't know how to set up their own websites and they don't have the money to do that. So I think that the impact is massive and Facebook needs to really think about the impact not just on those businesses now, but also on Facebook long term. Georgia Wilde, when you woke up this morning, how did you react? Uh, I was a bit shocked. As like a previous student editor, I was surprised that student publications at universities were kind of roped into this, especially because they have a kind of a smaller like readership and also uh, independent small um, media organisations targeted at youth. And I think those platforms use Facebook because it's widely used and it's easily to disseminate like uh, very digestible content for young people um, and it's also easy to facilitate conversation and comments and so I was just kind of taken aback that that opportunity was taken away from those platforms which really rely on it. So what's your question for the panel? Uh, my question is how will small publications with little budget who often represent marginalised voices be able to survive these restrictions and what will the government do to ensure that they will be as protected as major media corporations? Yeah. Right, let, put that let, to let me, yeah, yeah, let me have a go at that one. Because, um, Georgia, I think you, you've nailed it. I think that Facebook, this, the, the move by Facebook is going to devastate a lot of small publishers. And disproportionately, the small guys and the young guys and the online guys and the big guys are going to be OK. But some of these people, as you would know, get up to 80, 90 per cent of their traffic straight from Facebook. So they're gone overnight. And I know from talking to people in the industry that this is going to cost jobs, quite a lot of jobs. Um, Where will those jobs be? Well, if you get 90 per cent of your traffic and you're a news producer uh, and you get revenue from that traffic uh, and it goes overnight, um, that's a big problem. Now, the, pretty much the only good thing that I think is in the code um, that um, Paul obviously champions, and just about everyone else does too, but 
about the only good thing is the advance warning of algorithm change. So, sorry, I don't want to get too um, into the detail, but I don't think that the code is a good thing. Um, Facebook did uh, sort of telegraph ahead of time that they were going to do this. Uh, Rod Sims, the uh, uh, ACCC uh, chief, said it was brickmanship, and I think that they proved that they were willing to... <laughs> they, they, they proved they were willing to go beyond that brink, didn't they? I would say as someone who was in the tech industry for 22 years, it was a pretty clumsy misfire. I mean, they let Google take all the body blows and the shrapnel, and then they went with the nuclear option without any warning. They deployed, um, you know, language, um, natural language processing systems that had glitches, um, and then you ended up with this, this overblocking. Um, so it shows how much market power that they have and what steps they're willing to take. You know, this isn't just about Australia to them. This is about precedent and um, the risk that it poses to them on a global scale if other governments um, follow suit. You, you're someone that, in your role as eSafety Commissioner, has spent years trying to get these platforms to take content, take material off their platforms. They talk continuously about how impossible that is to do. How then can Facebook overnight switch off news and information for a whole country if they can't tackle abuse imagery on their, on their well, site? Well, precisely. They can target advertising with deadly precision. They should be able to target child sexual abuse material, racism, online hate, all of these things. It's, it's really a matter of priorities and corporate will, which is why we have pushing them so hard around safety by design. Safety is considered a cost centre or an afterthought. So and an important point here, Hamish, is that when we set up the eSafety Commission, we legislated to do that in 2014, the companies all said, no, no, this isn't necessary. Uh, it's un un inappropriate interference with our business. Uh, so these kinds of threats are not new. Uh, we, we stuck to our guns and we now have a world-leading uh, safety regulator, uh, online safety regulator. Michelle can, I, can I jump in, Hamish, on this? Um, sure. In terms of... Your just in terms of your point about, you know, why the why the, the companies haven't been more forceful in terms of getting disinformation off of their sites and other harmful content, I think one of the key reasons is that it goes to their logic and to their profit motive, and that that type of content drives user engagement. We've seen that disinformation on those sites drives user engagement. We've seen posts that solicit, you know, primal emotions like fear and hate drive you user engagement. So that's a key part of the reason why they haven't had the will to tackle some of the disinformation, hate speech, and all sorts of other things on their platforms until it became too much and too much of a reputational issue for them. I do just want to jump in very quickly about something a bit more fundamental, that a lot of the questions that have been asked so far by the audience gets to the fact that it's the users who are impacted by this. But let's not fool ourselves. The decisions that were made around the commercial code that Facebook made, that government made, that media made, were not based on the user and their needs. They were based on the commercial interests of the tech companies and the commercial interests of me major media news organizations. And the user has been completely caught off guard and in the middle. That's true, isn't it, Michelle Rowland? Labor supported all of this, but the collateral of the Australian consumers. We absolutely have always supported the principle that the ACCC outlined in terms of news media outlets being able to monetize their content, which the platforms have been enjoying for free uh, for decades now. And that level of disruption really is what has led to such substantial contractions um, in the Australian media market. It's seen jobs go. It's seen the traditional advertising and subscription models turned on their heads. But I would say two things. The first is, this last couple of hours, I think, has caused a lot of people to reflect on what Facebook is. Uh, it started off as this networking portal that you could share uh, information with one another, you could share photos. And I don't think it was conceived uh, at the time that this would become one of the primary vehicles through which some 40% of Australians would access their news. Uh, so it has morphed into that, but I think the other point to note is has Facebook made its product completely uncompelling? Because it is a blanket ban on news. Uh, it means that no news at all can be shared, and it also means that so many um, other sites have been impacted. So we've seen different search engines uh, come and go over the years. Once upon a time, we all had Internet Explorer, we all had MySpace. Uh, so I think it really has called into question 
is this the beginning of the end of Facebook? But, but if this is a contest between the power of the sovereign state versus the tech giant, hasn't Facebook just thumbed its nose at Australia? It's thumbed its nose, but I don't think that this is the end of the story yet. Uh, the point is that, uh, as Rod Sims outlined, the reason why Facebook is able to act in this way is because it enjoys substantial market power and has just reinforced that. That is the whole reason why regulation needed to be devised in order to ensure that that market power was kept in check. But, but now, they, we would hope... Paul Fletcher's bluff. Well, can I just pick up on the point that Michelle made? If you go back 25 years ago, the, the ex expectation was that the internet would be lots of uh, small sites, uh, very um, uh, disaggregated, lots of diversity. But in fact, we've, uh, it's ended up being um, a small number of very large businesses. And that does raise very serious market power issues, as Michelle rightly says. And these are issues But that it wasn't ended up... It didn't end up that way. I'm sorry to interrupt. It didn't end up that way just out of inevitability. It ended up that way because it was not regulated. We have gotten ourselves into a position where we have let a major commercial company that's driven pro by profit motive essentially be responsible for a huge part of our information infrastructure. This was not by accident. This is something that was caused by lack of regulation, and it's incumbent upon us as citizens in a democracy and our elected representatives to have done something about this and to let us think creatively now. I mean, I think this is a really a key moment for us. Uh, you know, I'm sorry to hear about the disruption for everybody, but at the same time, this has energized me to think that we can now come up with some creative solutions, perhaps, around a public infrastructure, not do it, not... Can I interrupt, Lydia? Because I've got a question I, I, for Lydia. Can, if I can just uh, finish the point I was making and acknowledge what, what Lydia said there. So I think governments around the world have been working through the implications of this and to pick up your point about sovereignty, you know, it is not acceptable to the Government of Australia or any other sovereign nation uh, that um, uh, giant global corporations are controlling the information that comes to our citizens. Traditional media is exposed to regulation in terms of content and other things and we've been working to put in place similar regulation, including safety regulation. But hang on, uh, you've just cut off millions of your citizens to access... Well, let's to, be very to, clear. And that regulation, regulation is different from a, an anti a code that is supposed to regulate con uh, competition. You know, regulation, I think, of Facebook is a great idea. The thing I wanted to ask Lydia was, is she uh, a supporter of the code or not, the code as it stands? I couldn't pick it up from what you were saying, Lydia. Well, I, I've admitted that I don't have a lot of expertise on the actual code of itself, but I think with the media code, it's, it's a sideshow, I think, to a bigger issue. The bigger issue is, is that these major companies are, have gained way too much power. And the media code is one very small part of dealing with that. There's more fundamental issues that we need to address here in terms of how we access information, who we let be the gatekeepers of that. You know, our access to information is a public good, and we have put it in the hands of commercial ent entities with very little re regulation up until now. I think right now we're dealing with a reckoning around regulation and the and the um, and the, the the actions of these companies. But there were many years before there where you know we were just caught up in the novelty of it all um, and didn't properly um, address these issues. And can I just pick up on that point that Lydia has made because it's a really powerful one. Going back five or ten years ago, indeed, when we were working on the establishing the safety commissioner. When governments, when the Australian government was talking about regulating the, uh, 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 the platforms, the message we got back was, oh, no, you can't do that, you'll be a technological backwater. And that argument was widely accepted even 10 years ago. I think community attitudes have evolved quite sharply, and I, I think I'm very confident in saying what Facebook has done today will, will further cause an evolution of community attitudes. All right, remember, you can stream us live on iView, but tonight, not on Facebook for the first time in many years. You can, however, join the conversation on Instagram, one of their products, and Twitter as well. Quanda is the hashtag. Please do play nicely. Our next question comes from Alessio Colley. Uh, the traditional media, the traditional revenue base of the media, i.e. advertising, has been in decline for a lot longer than Facebook, Google or any other ad tech company has been in business, largely because the internet has pre precipitated a decline in the media's, you know, particularly the print media's geographic monopoly, which was really important for things like classifieds uh, and other advertising uh, in the 20th century. Why is it that the Australian government uh, is using a competition regulator the ACCC to essentially prop up an uncompetitive business model. How Crawford? 
Yes, Alessio, what an awesome question. Um, I'm with you. Um, I, I basically I agree with the premise of your question, and uh, I would point out that there, at the bottom of the code uh, is basically it's based on one bad idea, and that is that the digital platforms owe the news companies for linking to their content, and that is. I think it's wrong, and if it were right, then basically the internet wouldn't work very well at all, uh, and a lot of other people would be owed a lot of money. You know, take take academics for example; they put a lot of effort into making their content. Their content is indexed by Google. Are they going to be compensated as well? Uh, no, they're not. So. Bang on, Alessio. So Google's done all these deals with Australian media companies, doing more of them this week. $30 million or so yep. to Seven West Media, yep. $30 million to your former uh, Nine Entertainment group. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. What are they actually paying for? Yeah, I, you know, it's... That basically, they're being paid to be left alone. And uh, it... In Google's other paying to be left alone. In other words, it is protection money. So I've... Um, I've got some information about the, some of the makeup of those deals. And although it's been characterised as, oh, it's all for Google Showcase, actually there are large chunks of those deals that don't relate to sh uh, Google Showcase and don't really relate to any value exchange. They are money that is being paid. Uh, and it's a bad situation because it's, a, you know, the, so the, basically, it's a global precedent. They're being paid. Or they're, they're being paid for this content so that Google isn't included. The search bid is not included in the legislation once it's passed. Right, right? because that would disrupt. I mean, th th I think Google got into a very tight situation. And one thing I would say about the legislation is very clever. It's clever, but it's not good. So I mean, they were squeezed. You know, pincer movement, and they. Uh, they had the opportunity, they either could go with a global precedent that would wreck their business model, i.e. pay for search, or they could uh, uh, go with uh, leaving, uh, leaving the market to one of their biggest competitors, Microsoft, can I just, walking away from $4 billion. Can I just pick up Alessio's point? Because you're, you're right to ask the question, um, what is the competition law issue here? Why is our competition regulator making this recommendation? It's because of the enormous market power that Google and Facebook have in the market for digital advertising, where they are competing with other news media businesses, and in doing so, they use content from those businesses to attract eyeballs to their sites, which they very successfully monetize. And so the ACCC's competition analysis is that uh, that raises competition problems, which need to be addressed, and the model it's proposed and that we're executing on is the uh, the code with a negotiate arbitrate model, which is a tool which is used uh, as a competition regulation tool in other industries in Australia, like energy and uh, telco, for example. So there's a well-established precedent for it. So it's a competition issue. It's also a public policy issue, because if we don't have a diverse, well-resourced media, that is a bad thing in a democracy as the sources of diverse opinion start to diminish. I just want to draw you back, though, to these deals, though. It's been put to me by multiple people involved in these deals at a very senior level that nobody cares whether Google News Showcase works. It might, in fact, be worth nothing. Why, then, has the government created a situation in which Google is paying Nine Entertainment, Seven West, $30 million for something that nobody thinks is worth anything? Well, the principle of the code is that it's for the parties to do commercial deals and for them to work out uh, the terms of those deals. Um, the ACCC's advice to us is that in a market where there was not a huge imbalance of bargaining power, mm. that these commercial deals would happen in the ordinary course, but they haven't been happening because Google and Facebook have been powerful enough to say, no, we're not even going to but talk But do you through. acknowledge that the value of these deals does not reflect the value of the content going on Google News Showcase? Well, the determination of the deals is a matter for the parties, and quite specifically, it's set up for the commercial negotiations to be done between news media businesses on the one hand, the platforms on the other. It's not for government to get in. It, there's a very the important point, another very important point here is that this is not the best way to support public interest journalism. Now, is there any guarantee that any of this money, $30 million, I, my estimate is $100 million over uh, per annum over several years, so that's a lot of money. Is any of it, does any of it have to go to public interest journalism? 
Oh, the answer I mean, to that is no, isn't it? The answer is no, but I thought I could be dramatic and put it to the <laughs> Well, but, but, the, but the point is, these are businesses that make their money out of journalism. That, that's, their, that's their strategy. That's their competitive advantage. Uh, and so, therefore, uh, they've got a strong commercial interest in improving the quality of their journalism. And if you've got more resources, you've got more capacity. So, Julia McGrath, is this good policy? I was going to get back to Alessio's question, if no, I could. No, but I just want you to tell me, do you think this is good policy? Um, I think it's novel policy and we're testing the boundaries. Um, it was clearly enough to scare both Google and Facebook to try and do whatever they could to evade the policy. Um, but back to what Alessio was saying, you know, the disintermediation of the media industry has been happening for 20 years that they've been bleeding revenue. It probably started with Craigslist and then the real estate sites. Um, and, and also back to Lydia's point, um, when we're talking about these global behemoths with, you know, GDPs, um, you know, comparable to most companies, we do need global global pincher moves here. Um, I remember having a conversation with Rod Sims a couple of years ago, saying, "I can't believe that Facebook was allowed to." acquire Instagram and then acquire WhatsApp and then acquire Oculus. They acquired, which is what a typical monopolist does, the, F the US FTC and US DOJ did nothing, the European Commission did nothing. So it's, it's not really Australia's problem um, around the, you know, trying to um, you know, regulate them for competition. We're actually at the <coughs> forefront of regulation. Of Michelle the tech Rowland, industry. why then doesn't Australia just tax these tech giants properly? If they want to put money back into the public system, do it that way. That's a really valid question, and I think it draws out the fact that the project that the ACCC undertook in looking at the uh, digital platforms, the code was one element of it. There were many other elements um, within that that this government has yet to address. Uh, the code is an important part of it, but also important is looking at regulatory arrangements, updating those to be uh, relevant to today, ensuring that we have adequate and stable funding for the ABC, for example. That was a specific recommendation of the Digital Platforms Inquiry. Looking at philanthropy and tax arrangements, there is a list as long as your arm, even after uh, you start looking um, at the code. So we, what we need is really a holistic approach that recognises not all content is created equal. It does go to some really important values um, within a democracy and the fourth estate um, being uh, a pillar uh, of that, particularly during a pandemic and particularly at a time when we are under so much strain in terms of the contractions in the media and we have regional television, for example, undergoing market failure. We have news deserts that are arising right across Australia. My region of Western Sydney hasn't had print media for quite some time now and now doesn't even have um, online media in the form of Facebook. So it's important for citizens to be able to be informed. But I just make the point, whilst we're talking about the code here tonight, it is not the silver bullet uh, for ensuring that we have a viable news media sector in Australia. All right, let's take our Hamish, next question. Can I, can I make a quick point of uh, Lydia, clarification I, on this? I just need to move on to our next question, if that's OK. It comes from Manisha yeah. Gopalan. The banning of Trump from Twitter and Facebook was broadly considered coherent and appropriate in the wake of the riots on Capitol Hill. Does censoring a head of state, however, set a dangerous precedent? How do you grapple with the reality that big tech has consolidated a substantial amount of power and control over public discourse? Lydia Khalil. Yeah, well, that question's a great question. It kind of went goes to the point that I was trying to make uh, earlier in the segment, is that they have consolidated so much power and so much control of, over our public discourse. Um, I think that, um, you know, the, that banning of, of Trump sent an important signal, but one that came entirely too late. The fact is, is that there's all sorts of disinformation um, that is rife on these platforms that a lot of them have taken action on, but belatedly. And Trump is one example of that. Uh, Julia McGrath, was it right to ban Trump from Twitter, take him off Facebook? Well, I agree. It was in the 11th hour. Um, if you look at some of the data from the, ele the election um, investment partnership in the, the U.S., they found that 25 out of billions of Facebook and Twitter accounts accounted for a third of the misinformation on the lead up to the election. So again, back to inaction. Um, and this had to do with what we call misinformation super spreaders, like Donald Trump, who <laughs> has a gigantic me megaphone. So they had an outsized impact impact on misinformation. But he's a world leader. He is a world leader. And having worked at Twitter, um, they would have 
done everything possible to not take him off the platform, to keep the tweets pl flowing uh, in the public interest in it, because it's newsworthy. And by the way, it propped up their business model. Um, but he continued to violate their policies. And so when it wasn't just with misinformation, he would use that gigantic megaphone and he would abuse, he would target it and abuse individual citizens and members of his, his administration um, in violation of the Twitter rules. So not enforcing those fairly and consistently is a problem. Waiting to the 11th hour and three quarters um, or two minutes to 12 was a little too late. Should they have done it earlier during his presidency? I think they should have enforced the rules that they had in the House. You know, you know, the way I think about it is each of these platforms is different in character. They're like a different house. They all have different house rules. They can set their own rules and they can, you know, kick out the drunk uncle or send little Johnny to his room or they can keep it tidy or they can keep it toxic. But they can't allow illegal activity to happen in their houses. They can encroach upon their neighbors. Um, you know, there are, there are laws that they also need to uphold beyond their own policies. Paul Fletcher, was it right to kick Trump off these platforms? Well, these platforms do have terms of use and indeed uh, in social media and, and in traditional media, um, there are, it's not unprecedented, in fact we've had it for a long time, private companies that are the, the gateway to how people are getting their message mm. uh, 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 disseminated and, and indeed today... I'm confused about what your answer is, were they right or wrong? Well, I just want to make the point that they've got terms of use and they're entitled to use them. When you, when you go onto a platform, you're operating under their terms of use, but that's not actually a so, new thing. But they, so they did the right thing? Um, th they're entitled to... If, if, if somebody has breached the terms of use, they're entitled to make that decision. Now, one of the points, one of the things that... I just want to be clear for our audience, because I think they want to know, do you think Twitter and Facebook did the right thing by kicking Trump off? Uh, I, they are entitled to you, allocate, to employ their own terms of use and make those decisions, yes. Okay. And so they were right in kicking Craig Kelly off Facebook as well? Look, those are decisions for those organisations. I'm not going to sit here and comment on individual decisions that are made, but I do make the point they have terms of use. It's not an unregulated environment. In fact, one of the public policy issues is all too often they don't enforce their own terms of mm. use. And we certainly see that, and I think it's fair to say, Julie, you see that every day in, in online safety issues. Uh, absolutely. And, and that's why we were set up as a safety net um, to help you know bridge that inherent power imbalance between the tech behemoths and the individual users uh, particularly when they're experiencing some kind of abuse but um, the new powers that are being considered um, very soon with the online safety act reforms will pr give the, us precisely those kinds of powers around the basic online safety expectations they do need a license to operate and they need to fairly and consistently enforce the rules that they have. So would we be better off if there were, more broadly, more regulation of what tech companies do? Um, I, I think so. And it has to be smart and pragmatic regulation. And, and sometimes you're going to achieve things with the stick, but often we achieve a lot with the carrot. So, um, you, you know, the, the minister noted that, um, you know, the... They, they claimed that, you know, we were going to quash innovation and free speech with the establishment of the um, e-safety office. Google and Facebook also didn't agree to work directly with us on what we call the um, cyberbullying tier scheme, which basically was, again, about precedent. They weren't going to support the idea of an online safety regulator because they didn't want a domino effect. Well, we're starting to see that domino effect play out. So we've been, in, you know, in, in practice and having um, pretty good impact for the past six years. We're talking to Canada and Fiji and the U.S. and uh, the U.K. and Ireland. And there will be a network of online safety regulators around the globe because they've helped us cross that Rubicon. OK, that leads us to our next question. It comes from Alice Deng. The algorithms of big tech are designed to give viewers more of what they want to see. And this has made us more divided and polarised as a society. So what should be done to rectify this? And should it be the role of governments or the tech companies to devise the solution? Lydia Khalil, the governments or the tech ch companies? I think regulation lies in the hands of, of government. And I think that the, that question goes at the very heart of it. We have these non-transparent algorithms governing what we see and how we see it. 
These companies look at these algorithms as if it's commercial property, and they guard it as proprietary information, just like the spices for the KFC fried chicken. But the reality is, is the, these algorithms are actually governing a lot of our information and environment, and we don't have any transparency around, around them. So algorithmic transparency is really critical. It's difficult. It has to be done, you know, smartly. Um, but we have to we have to do it. We can't have non-transparent algorithms, run, uh, you know, ruling what it is, what information that we consume, and how we connect online. Hal Crawford, you were a news director in New Zealand when the Christchurch attacks happened. Mm. So much of those attacks were streamed live on some of the tech mm. platforms like Facebook. But you, along with some of the other news bosses in New Zealand, then made some really big decisions, heavily criticised by some, about how you were going to cover this story. Yeah. I was uh, actually immensely proud of that little chapter and, of course, it came in the wake of a, a, a horrific crime. What did you decide? Uh, we de uh, Good point. We, de we decided to, uh, to cover the trial of the gunman uh, in a certain way. And, and when I say we, I mean all of the news editors of New Zealand, all of the big, uh, the big newsrooms. So uh, I'd never been part of that before. I'd never been part of a very competitive environment where all the news editors get together and decide to do something that was basically decent. Which was what? Which was um, not give the guy publicity, basically. Not um, sort of publicise his hateful ideology. And we were very successful. Um, you know, where, you, where your competitor might delve into his ridiculous manifesto and get all sorts of juicy crap out of it, we decided that we wouldn't do that. And uh, the guy just has faded into obscurity. Uh, you know, he's a hateful individual and, he sh and, he's, and he's not even smart. Um, and with that collective ignoring, we sort of, we, we had a bit of a victory. Are, are you burying the news a bit? Uh, well, that's what we were accused of. Uh, and I thought, no, actually we're not. We're just doing the right thing. Michelle? And I think whilst I agree there is a role for government and there is a role for industry, there is also a role um, for uh, everyday citizens as well. I mean, you, you specifically ask about um, algorithms, uh, Alice, and you know, how that they are utilised uh, by tech in order to deliver, you know, get more eyeballs, get more clicks, etc. You know, I'm a mum, working mum, with a four-year-old and a nine-year-old that are smarter than I ever was at their age and have more access to technology. I struggle every day with this question and I'm sure there are millions of Australian um, parents and, and citizens who feel the same way. Knowing how to get that balance between enabling uh, our young people and as they grow to be able to access um, technology and access the internet and access all these applications. But you just look at YouTube, for example, there's an algorithm that determines what video will pop up next and what video will pop up uh, after that. Um, so I think that it is, it is a role that needs to be played by all parties here, by industry, by government um, and by citizens. They all, we need to be empowered as citizens to make those decisions. We often get it wrong, we get judgment, uh, but at the same time I think that uh, there is a role for everyone um, to play in this. Julie, have tech companies forfeited the right to be trusted on this stuff? I mean, this is ultimately a question about whether they should be deciding the future of these platforms. But given what we've seen today, Facebook in Australia, can we trust them? Yeah, it was more of a face plant by Facebook, <laughs> I think, today. It was a real misfire. But, um, yeah, obfuscation is a huge problem, and I think that's one of the reasons that that the minister wanted to put somebody in this role who had actually been in technology so that I understand the, the dirty rules and the playbook. Um, so I understand what the talking points are going to be. I'll what, give are you the, a, what are I'll the give dirty you, rules? Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you... An example of why um, I, I think they um, we need to hold them to account. Um, I had Facebook executives in in the office last week, and they said, well, "Why do you keep criticizing us about um, you know moving Messenger to end-to-end -to -end encryption?" I said, "Because I've been asking you for 18 months one question: What are you going to do to ensure that child sexual abuse material is not traded on?" that platform and that when you flip that switch and it goes dark, you're not just going to go like this. Um, 
because they, they won't tell me what they are going to do to keep children safe. I give them suggestions. What about homomorphic encryption tools? What about behavioral signals? They won't commit to that. So they're trying to kick the can down the street so that they can flip the switch and um, it happens and they've been absolved of responsibility. And we've seen just in the six weeks that the e-privacy directive has eliminated um, a company's ability to scan for child sexual abuse images. Facebook said, we're stopping. NECMEC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in the United States, has seen a 50% decrease in the reporting of child sexual mm. abuse images after just six weeks. Lydia Clear, you've been researching the rise of extremism within the United States uh, and its connection to the tech platforms. Tell us what we don't know yet about this. Well, I mean, no doubt um, the use of social media has increased the scope of radicalization um, because it has increased disinformation on these platforms. It's increased the ability of extremist actors to connect and to organize. It's also increased the, the widespread breadth of exposure to some of these extreme ideologies through these platforms. So social media has played a big role in terms of the growth of extremism. Now, the major tech companies like Facebook, YouTube, have done steps to address this. But like we've been talking about in the program, a lot of it has come too late. For example, we've seen with the QAnon phenomenon, that has taken off because of its activities on social media. And that, that conspiracy has led to real world violence and harm. We saw it with the Capitol siege. They played a big part of that. Now, that was allowed to fester on major social media platforms for years before they decided to shut it down. So we've always seen this delayed reaction that the commissioner was just speaking about, which has been problematic. The other side of this is what's going on outside of the major social media platforms. When, that, when they've been shut out, extremist actors have moved to smaller platforms that are even less regulated. Um, and they uh, you know, go to platforms like Gab, Telegram, where they're able to go unfettered. And that's drawn in more extremist actors into those platforms. And so it's a real issue around technology and extremism and the growth of violent radicalization. Right. The can thing I, is, though, uh, can, yeah. can, can I just pick up on, on a couple of the themes from, from Lydia and Julie and indeed Hal, that these companies have become very powerful very quickly. If you take the instance that Hal was talking about, if uh, television stations, uh, if anybody even suggested that they would broadcast uh, uh, murder occurring, um, that would have been unthinkable and part of that is the responsibility and maturity of those businesses uh, but you take an action like today shutting down services which are used to provide vital health information or other information I mean one of the things I was thinking about was I worked in the telco sector for a long time uh, Michelle has, has worked in the telco sector as well there's a very strong culture in telco in telecommunications that you keep the network up you connect people that's your mission that's your job and for a company that is supposed to be providing communications to just turn big parts of the network off today, as Facebook has done, I mean, that would be, I think, unthinkable for telecommunications. Can I, can I take, take you up on a point there, Minister, around... I mean, if you were in telcos, you know that carriers are not the same as publishers, and carriers are not responsible for the material that they, they carry, otherwise they wouldn't work. And I think we've got a similar problem here. It's very simple to say, oh, they should ban... They should, should have banned QAnon, they should ban everything. But effectively, they see themselves and we use them as carriers. The utility to us would be much less if they were publishers. So it's not just about two big evil companies called Facebook and Google. It's about us. We, we demand social networks and we demand search. And then we get the crap as well. So it's not but simple. They, they market, but they market themselves as, or they portray themselves as neutral platforms, but they're actually not neutral platforms. They have a certain logic to how they operate, which is engagement. So they will push what drives engagement, and often what drives engagement can be extremist content, can be disinformation, you know, can in, in be fact, things often that... In fact, often is, Lydia. I think you, you, exactly. make a, you make a great point, but my point is that they, they can't be publishers, they can't be carriers in the traditional sense, not purely. There's something in between, and this is why we're in uncharted waters. All right. Let's take a question on something entirely different tonight. This comes from Brett Kriesler. 
Regarding the uh, Canberra rape claim, I was wondering if the police were notified at the time, and if they so, what action did they take? And if they weren't notified, why weren't they? Paul Fletcher. Uh, well, Brett, thank you for that question. Um, the uh, Minister, uh, Linda Reynolds, um, who was uh, uh, Brittany's uh, em employer, uh, spoke about uh, this in the Senate today. Uh, obviously, um, what happened to Brittany um, uh, was uh, terrible and um, it's very important we learn lessons from that. Um, I, I, the, the precise uh, details and sequence um, uh, the, the, the Minister has, has spoken about, um, but I, I'd prefer to confine my comments to saying, look, um, we need to learn from this and do better. In most of our workplaces, though, if an alleged rape took place, the police would be there pretty fast. Why doesn't that necessarily happen in Parliament House? Well, what, what uh, the Minister has said is that uh, the... She, she provided support to Brittany and it was a question for Brittany uh, as to whether she chose, wanted to make the complaint. Um, but look, it's very important that we learn lessons from this. Um, certainly when uh, I became aware of what happened, uh, I called my staff together. As it happens, I have more women on my staff than men. Uh, and uh, I asked each of them to, if they had concerns about the safety of their workplace, to come and speak to me. Everybody's entitled to a safe workplace, whether it's Parliament House or anywhere else around Australia. And clearly, um, uh, that was not the experience of Brittany had. When, when did you first hear any mention of this? When it came into the news on, I think, Monday. You'd never heard a whisper? I had not. And Michelle Rowland? I didn't know about this until it uh, made the media uh, as well. But... I would say that I think Ms Higgins has been uh, very brave. I think there are a number of questions that remain to be answered about who knew what and when. Um, that is not going to undo uh, the terrible experience um, that she has gone through. And coming from a corporate background, um, this would not be the sequence of events, I would say, that would occur in a private organisation. What, what would the normal sequence of events be? The normal sequence would be there would be a clearly um, established process um, for a firm about the kinds of behaviour um, that are expected. There would be clearly uh, established complaints mechanisms. And uh, there would also be um, rules to be followed about um, when people became aware of this. So. I think it's, it's, there's clearly an issue in, um, in Parliament House. There's clearly an issue going on, on here. Um, and it is right that this be independently investigated. But I think ultimately it also comes down to we want to make sure that um, the workplace in Parliament House is a safe one. Can you just help us all understand, if something happens in your office in Parliament House, is there, is there a clear set of rules or guidelines or protocols about what should happen? Well, clearly, we have particular rules um, as a party um, mm. uh, around those matters. But in terms of having them you know, publicised and being widely known, I think they are yet to be properly documented. Mm. Uh, and I think that is an indictment um, on the parliamentary process that we don't have yet. Yeah. Clearly, um, there are rules and processes that the Department of Parliamentary Services um, would need to follow. But when you hear... Uh, Ms Higgins' accounts of um, security guards coming in, of evidence potentially um, being destroyed, um, of being led into a particular office um, against parliamentary procedures. Clearly there is a separate set of procedures um, that are called into question here. Mm. I think there needs to be very clear guidance um, given to the parliament. We do not want to repel um, people, particularly um, young people, and I will say particularly women, um, from pursuing a career in the parliamentary process. OK, I want to tell you our next question. It's from Claudia Strawn on this topic. Um, so, to your point, what message do you think the experience of Brittany Higgins, both the incident itself and how it was dealt with internally, sends to young Australian women who might be considering a career in politics? And do you think the new initiative proposed by the Prime Minister in response to the incident is enough to stamp out the well-known toxic workplace culture in our parliament? Lydia Khalil? I don't think it sends a very good message at all. Um, but I think that this is an issue, um, like many issues, that go beyond parliament. I mean, on one hand, I'm incredibly grateful to Brittany for coming out um, and making these allegations publicly because it was clearly in the public interest. 
at the same time am incredibly angry and incredibly frustrated that once again it falls to alleged victims to have to bear the brunt of it on their emotions and on their psyche to bring out these things into public light for us to do something about them. There is a serious problem in Australia globally around violence against women. And the fact that this alleged perpetrator felt that they would have such impunity to commit this act, whether they were impaired by alcohol or not, in the halls of power, in a minister's office, is just incredibly astounding to me. And it sends a terrible message. And clearly, we have to do more. And men need to do more. This is a male problem. Julie? Uh, I mean, I think Brittany Higgins is extra extraordinarily brave, and I think about Grace Tame and that these two young, incredible women are bearing the brunt of some really important cultural change that needs to happen. Um, and I go back to 30 years when I was working in the U.S. Congress and had a similar incident happen. Um, and I can understand why she would be paralyzed. Um, and. It's not about me. Thousands of Australian women have probably gone through this. It's, um, it's global. It's, um, and, of course, I worked in high tech, which is male-dominated. So all I want to say is we need to listen to these women. We need to believe them. We need to understand them. We need to help them. And we all have to get behind them and change the culture globally. It will be news to many people watching that you experienced something similar. What made you at the time stand up and say something? Um, I didn't. I didn't for uh, well over a year because it was my direct manager. I had to look at him every day and I, I didn't feel he had power and I did not. I didn't feel I could confide in him. It wasn't until he left the office and my congressman, we had just gone through the uh, Anita Hill Clarence Thomas hearings, said, you know, Julie, I want you to write a sexual harassment policy. And by the way, this hasn't happened in our office, has it? And um, so I volunteered what happened. And guess what? There was a pattern of abuse and power. The woman who was in the role before me left because of this man. The woman at the reception was being um, sexually abused by this man. So, again, there, it's, it's about power. It's about, it's about um, precedent. And it's about being able to do it with impunity. So, so we have to act. So what is it about these spaces? Because this, the, you know, this question has come up time and time again on this program. So many stories emerge about what happens within our political spaces. What is it about the structure, the system, the imbalance that makes it so difficult for young women to be safe in their workplace? Well, I mean, I remember our intern coordinator, who was a young man, used to, used to hire the summer interns based on whether the guys were good bas baseball players or the girls were hot. Um, you'd walk by, um, you know, a southern senator's um, office and it would always have a pretty young woman in there and the media in DC this was 30 years ago would you know would would um, turn their heads at any picadillo so it is it is about male power structures and it's hard to have a frame of ref reference if you're a grown adult man with power to understand or be able to empathize with what a, a, a Brittany has experienced mm. uh, thank you for sharing that I'm really sorry that that happened to you Paul Fletcher does something need to change about the culture within the parties in order to, to facilitate a shift? Uh, well, I think we absolutely do need to learn from this. Um, the, there's a number of processes that the Prime Minister has announced in response, including Celia Hammond, the uh, member for Curtin, who's a former Vice-Chancellor of Notre Dame University, is leading a process. There's also some processes involving all of the party leaders. Uh, but yes, uh, we do need to learn from this. and. Um, uh, you walk these halls. I mean, the, the exercising of power is brazen. You know, it's raw at times and it's very masculine. You know, the way it's done in Canberra, I walk around those halls just as you do, just as Michelle does. It's a very blokey environment, isn't it? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Has that got to change? Look, the, 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 there are yes, there are issues that we need to do a lot better on. Of course, I don't, nobody doubts. Nobody doubts it. Nobody disputes. Does that need to change, Michelle? I mean, Absolutely. it is it's so overtly blokey in Parliament. Absolutely, and I think 
Uh, it, it has changed over the years, but it hasn't changed in some areas quickly enough. Um, if, in terms of, for example, uh, women's representation, uh, that has improved in some aspects, but not in others. And Labor has made a... I can only speak for the Labor Party. We've made a very consistent uh, attempt to do that over a couple of decades now in terms of affirmative action policies. But I think we also need to look beyond uh, the representation there. We need to look at the advisor level. We need to look at inclusiveness um, as a whole. Um, yeah, and that includes includes inclusiveness of First Nations people, ensuring that, you know, people with uh, a disability are encouraged to be part of the parliamentary process in, in various roles. So it's always a matter of continuous improvement. I mean, Labor's got a policy going to our national executive tomorrow to sign off on that's been uh, you know, thoroughly worked on uh, within our caucus um, going to all these points. But you can never stop trying. Mm. Like, it, it is a constant... It requires constant vigilance. The job is never done. How you used to work in one of the blokiest mm. news environments in this country. Is it possible to shift mm. the culture, change these dynamics? Well, culture, um, you know, it's a given that culture comes from the top. And actually, if you speak to CEOs, they really feel out of control most of the time, except for their cultural input. And that is, they set forms of behaviour and, and the norms that the organisation um, follows. And they do that by being who they are, but also explicitly. So um, I think, and I've had some parliamentary experience as well in state parliament, and I found it an intensely strange place. And I think that with all the ebbs and flows of power, you were talking about what it feels like. Well, it feels weird. And to me, you know, it's random people coming up and talking to you and, and you know, the exercise of power, but the handover of power. So the cultural continuity isn't there. Look, it's clear, it is clearly an unusual working environment. And um, Michelle makes a good point about it's certainly uh, politicians, but it's also uh, people working in offices and indeed everybody. There's over 4,000 people who work in Parliament House. They all have an entitlement to a safe workplace. It's about uh, respect. It's about the behaviour that's modelled at all levels. Uh, and do we need to do better? Yes, we do. OK. That's all we have time for tonight, almost. There's something great to stick around for. But a huge thanks to our panel, Paul Fletcher, Michelle Rowland, Hal Crawford, Julie Inman Grant and Lydia Khalil. Please thank all of them. Thank you. thank you so much for joining us tonight and to those of you streaming us at home on iPhone.